I am honored to introduce three individuals who are extraordinary participants in the debate. Uh, people with exceptional uh, background skills, expertise, competence, and erudition. I'm John Dunn. I'm an emergency physician in Texas. I write a little bit for Heartland on environmental issues and health care issues, and, and uh, I have an opinion on almost everything because I'm also a lawyer. Um, but I don't practice law, so there's no danger. I won't sue you for uh, insulting me afterwards. And we're going to start off with Ender Goklani. And I hope I said that well enough. Did Perfect. I do okay? Thank you. This is a guy who's still working for the government in spite of the fact that he probably would be accused by James Hansen, if not a number of other people, of some kind of seditious activity. Um, in addition to the fact that he writes great books, and I have his books on the issues of environmentalism, public health, and epidemiology, he also um, speaks well and uh, will be happy to tell you all that you need to know about the area of health effects, global warming, and the issues at hand. Thanks, Inder. Thank you very much. I have to congratulate Heartland and its co-sponsors for putting this uh, event together. I wish they were a little bit less uh, uh, efficient about this because there really is so much going on. I'd like to be at a couple of other places myself. Um, before I start, since I do work for the government, I think it's important that everybody recognizes that uh, the views that I express here are only mine and not necessarily those of the Department of the Interior or any branch of the U.S. governments. That's important. Okay, let's get beyond that. Now, much of the scientific debate around climate change has focused on whether climate has warmed by how much, how rapidly, and due to what. I will sidestate this de debate. Instead, what I'll do is I'll assume that the IPCC's so-called consensus view of climate change, that climate change is very likely due to anthropogenic uh, uh, and greenhouse gases is valid. I'll also assume that analyses of the impacts of climate change based on this view and the IPCC's emission scenarios are valid. I'll use the results of impact studies undertaken by proponents of the IPCC view and see exactly where they lead us. I will look at three claims about climate change impacts. First, that human and environmental well-being will be lower in a warmer world, even if we have wealth here. The second claim is that our descendants will be worse off than we are unless we reduce climate change now. And the third claim, which we hear often and repeated over and over again, is that global warming is the world's most important environmental problem. Now, for my analysis, I actually won't, uh, I'll take numbers that have been generated by other people, specifically people who are in very good graces of the IPCC itself. I will use results of something called the fast track assessments or the FTAs. These are a set of studies sponsored by the British government. The, the results are peer reviewed and the authors are intimately involved in the writing of the IPCC reports and have been since at least the second, third, and also the fourth assessment. I'll also use the results of the Stern Review on the economics of climate change. This was a 2006 study also sponsored by the British government. And the Stern Review actually refers quite heavily to the FTA studies, as, as the, uh, do the IPCC documents themselves. My mortality estimates will come from the World Health Organization, and my cost estimates will come from the IPCC itself and the United Nations Millennium Project. 
So all I'm doing is multiplying and dividing. The real heavy work has been done by somebody else. Okay. And I do this with the notion of finding out exactly what it is that th the studies of the promo proponents of doing something about global warming tell us. Here I have GDP per capita, which is an approximate measure of welfare per capita in the year 1990, which is actual, and, and in the year 2100, according to the IPCC's scenarios. The IPCC has four major lines of scenarios and they're arranged from the warmest on, on the left here to the, cool, uh, to the coolest on the right. And this of course is actual. What we see is that under each and every scenario, developing countries are going to be much better off than than they were in 1990. And the same thing's true for developed countries or industrialized countries. But this is in the absence of climate change. How about if climate were to change? Would that, uh, would they still be better off? That's one of the claims that has been ma made that they would not be better off. Also, I'm, uh, here I have not shown you numbers for 2200, but essentially what I did was I made some assumptions which actually give me estimates of GDP per capita in the absence of climate change, which are lower than what Stern, for example, himself has assumed. But I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the math here, we don't have time. This is what are the welfare losses due to climate change according to Nicholas Stern's report. These are welfare losses from 2050 to 2200. And the red line here is the is the mean estimate, whereas the envelope, the gray envelope, gives us the five percentile loss and the 95th percentile loss. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the, that the losses will be equivalent to the 95th percentile loss per the Stern Review report. Now, I'm going to warn you, a lot of economists believe that Stern has overestimated the negative impacts of climate change. So what I've done is I've taken those negative impacts and I've actually blown them, out, even those out of proportion. And this is for the, this particular uh, curve tells us that in the year 2200, losses could be as high as 35.2%. That's the 95th percentile estimate of losses under the high climate scenario, which is equivalent to the IPCC's A1FI scenario. And the losses include market impacts, non-market impacts, that the impacts due to public health and environmental consequences and the risk of catastrophe. So I'm going to subtract this out of the GDP per capita in the absence of climate change and I'll also do this for 2200, and this is what I get. I, it looks kind of busy, but I, it's actually, there's, and it's a lot less complicated. What this tells me is that after I account for climate change, despite the fact that I underestimated the GDP per capita in the absence of climate change for the year 2200, for example, and I overestimated the damages due to climate change, I see that in each and every case, for each and every scenario in the year 2200, first of all, let's look at the year 2100. In the year 2100, developing countries will be better off than they were actually in 1990. So would developed countries be better off in, uh, in 2100 than they were in 1990? And moreover, in the year 2200, both groups of countries will be even further, be, uh, or, or even more well off. Now what we see here is that, okay, first of all, this tells us that despite climate change, the well-being of future generations will be greater than what it was in 1990. And what, I, uh, what we see here also, okay, let me give you a little bit of context. Ni who knows what 1990 was like? 
does anybody, those were the good old days, right? So, uh, in the year 2006, uh, GDP, uh, GDP per capita for the United States was 30,000 per, per person. Uh, for industrialized countries, it was 19,000 per person. And for developing countries, it was 1,500, 1,500. So uh, in, under each case, we see that in the year 2200, developing countries will be better uh, uh, for, uh, for all the scenarios except for the poorest scenario, which is A2. For uh, developing countries will be much better off than developed countries were in 2006 and definitely better than what they were in 1990. Okay. Um, so this tells us that future generations won't be worse off than we are. So scratch that claim. The other thing that this tells us is that well-being will, uh, will be highest in the richest but warmest world. That's the A1FI. And, and, and well-being will be worst under the poorest scenario. So if governments want to push us towards a particular scenario, my suggestion is that they should push us towards a scenario that makes us wealthier rather than the one that gives us the least CO2 emissions. Okay, so much for that. Let's now take a look at um, whether or not climate change is the most important environmental and or public health problem. Here I have from the um, World Health Organization uh, global burden of disease uh, now, well, actually, what they did was they took a look at a whole bunch of environmental, nutritional, and food-related risk factors, and they estimated the mortality and the global burden of disease from that. What I have here is, is uh, the mortality uh, over here, and it tells us and, and, and I've ranked these food, environmental, and nutritional problems in terms of the mortality. And we find that in the top seven, uh, we do not have, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the list, there's no climate change on this list. But if I go on to the next page, I find climate change at number 13, at the, at the bottom of the list, essentially. And as uh, John had mentioned earlier in the morning session, we can see that the mortality due to climate change is supposed to be 0.3%. As I said, I'm not going to argue as to whether, that, whether or not that's a good number. Let's take it for granted. That's exactly what all we are doing is we are taking their numbers and we are seeing where they lead us. So they only contribute 0.3% of mortality, whereas if you take a look at some of the other risk, well, all the other risk factors obviously are going to be more than that because that's at the bottom of the list. Now, I did not rank malaria because a number of these malaria deaths that actually are due to malaria get ascribed to climate change. So when you do this methodology, use this methodology by the World Health Organization, malaria would never show up on one of the on priorities because essentially they took all the deaths uh, due to malaria and assigned it to something else. But uh, that's neither here nor, here nor there, but what, what we see is that today, based on, this is based on 2000 data, climate change is not the most important environmental or public health related problem. And this is also, I'm just looking at a subset. I'm only looking at those that are due to food, environmental, and uh, nutritional problems. Okay, but what about the future? Isn't it possible that as climate change uh, accelerates, there'll be greater and greater environmental and public health impacts. So it, perhaps in the future, we should, uh, it's possible that climate change will become sufficiently great that it should rise in, its, in the pr uh, general priority list. So to deal with that issue, I went to the fast track assessments. These are the studies that were done for the British government by a bunch of people who are essentially 
Uh, the co-authors co of the fast track assessment are actually also co-authors of many, most, uh, ma many sections of the IPCC's uh, assessment, uh, assessment that pertains to impacts. And at, what they have done there is they have looked at uh, populations at risk for malaria, hunger, and coastal flooding. And then uh, uh, I took their population at risk numbers and I got the WHO's mortality numbers and married the two. You know, if this is a population at risk and the mortality in that year, in the year uh, is so much, I made the translation and I converted everything to mortality because that way I have a common metric by which I can look at everything. Because having a population at, uh, having a population at risk of malaria estimated at say uh, two billion people and comparing that with the population at risk of hunger which is at 850 million people, you know, I, uh, you can't get from, you cannot really compare them unless you go to a common denominator, which I have used uh, mortality for. So based on this, in the year 1990, due to these three risk factors, there were a total of 4.4 million deaths in the year 1990. But in the year 2100, the number goes from anywhere from 2.1 million to 6.3 million, depending on which scenario I'm looking at. But the more important thing is that the red bar here gives me the mortality in the absence of climate change. Then what these folks do is they figure out, uh, uh, they do an analysis into the future, assuming uh, the climate doesn't change. Then they impose the carbon dioxide, um, uh, additional carbon dioxide thing onto that, and they estimate climate change, and then they rerun the model for, for a population at risk, which I've converted to mortality. And what, I sh what, what is surprising, well, maybe it's not uh, surprising, but what we see is that climate change contributes only a small portion to the total population uh, th th that could be dying from uh, these three risk factors. The share of climate change to the total mortality for these three risk factors varies from somewhere between 4% for this scenario, for B1, for the coolest scenario to 10% for A1 F, uh, Fi, the warmest scenario. So this tells me that if climate, cha uh, climate change may be important, but there are other things that are even more so. Let's look at uh, water. With respect, to, uh, with respect to water, I had no method of going from population at risk to mortality, so I just left it at population at risk. The red bar, in this case, is the total population at risk of water stress. And the, this violet bar is the, population at the additional population at risk because of climate change. Notice that these are all below the axis. In other words, the net po uh, population at risk of water stress actually declines because of uh, climate change. This is what the results show. If you read what the IPCC documents tells you, they, you have to read it like a lawyer. What they tell you is the additional population at risk, uh, 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 the, uh, the additional population that ex that uh, experiences, that would experience increased water stress. They never tell you about the additional, uh, the, the population that would not experience water stress or whose water stress would decline. So you have to read it like a lawyer. And because if you go into that, you find that in fact, lo and behold, water stress is actually on a net basis relieved by climate change. Now, the reason for this and, uh, is as follows. This is not to say that everybody will uh, uh, get more water. There will be areas that will have less water. But the areas that get less water are less populated than areas that get more water. Particularly, South Asia and East Asia will see more water, and Africa will see less. But when you, it so happens that the bulk of the population 
and in the world. More of it is located up in Asia than in Africa. So you get this figure. So what this tells us is that if you're going to do something about climate change, you could actually be worse off because you did something about climate change. Okay, this is, okay, so if you go back again, with respect to uh, public health related issues, mortality and water stress, it doesn't seem to me that climate change is the biggest deal around. Let's look at an environmental indicator. Here I'm looking at cropland. Now, the more cropland we have, the less habitat there is for the rest of nature. Therefore, less, um, uh, less cropland is actually an indicator that uh, and, uh, it's an indicator of environmental improvement, so to speak. It works in the opposite direction from what many people would think. Now, in the year 1990, 11.6% of the Earth's surface was in cropland. And according to the uh, FTAs, the uh, Fast Track Assessment reports, under the warmest scenario, I'm going to just concentrate on the warmest scenario. Under the warmest scenario, this could go down to 5%, which means there'd be more land for the rest of nature, which is, uh, which again tells me that climate change is actually making matters better. This for the year 2100, okay. This is for coastal wetlands. For coastal wetlands, we see that uh, cli uh, climate change will reduce the extent of wetlands, but non-climate change related factors will reduce it even further. So once again, climate change is important, but not as important as other factors. Okay, so, uh, so we see that when you put all this together, it doesn't seem to me that global warming is the world's most important environmental problem. Today, nor is it likely to be so in the year 2100. No, so the question is, how do we best attack global warming? Based on my, my stuff, I think I've got time for one slide, and I will just do that. Let's go to this slide. We've seen this one before. This is on mortality. If we eliminate climate change, we will reduce mortality from these three risk factors by 10%. Okay? And actually, I'm not even talking of eliminating uh, climate change. I'm talking of rolling it back to 1990 levels. Under the Kyoto Protocol, assuming that it, uh, 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 it reduces climate change by about 7%, we would not get, uh, uh, we'd be able to reduce this not by 10%, but 1%. So for the Kyoto Protocol is going to reduce mortality by less than 1%. It's going to cost something like 160 to $180 billion per year, depending on whose numbers you're looking at, assuming everybody who signed to Kyoto actually Im uh, implements it. On the other hand, there are different approaches of dealing with this. For example, let's take a look at malaria. If we eliminate malaria, we would reduce this by, uh, by, something, uh, by uh, something like three or four percent. Reduce mortality by three or four percent. On the other hand, if we use a different approach, suppose, for example, we have a malaria vaccine, then that malaria vaccine would be able to deal with malaria regardless of what caused that malaria. The mosquito doesn't care uh, that was there because of climate change or not. The malaria vaccine would work regardless. That way we'd be able to go after not just 3% of the problem, but the, uh, the entire 100% of the problem. And that I call focused adaptation, and I will welcome uh, questions on, on that when I come back. Sorry. Sorry for not being able to finish. <laughs>